<laughs> Cody hungry! Cody hungry for news! Hello everybody. So, Palestine and Israel. We're not going to talk about it because, we're told, it's too complicated to understand or discuss or do anything about. But, counterpoint, we will talk about it because is it too complicated to understand? Could only the titanic-sized intellect of Jared Red 25 Books Kushner understand the intricacies of the conflict? Well, first, let's go over the current situation. While media coverage of Israel-Palestine has improved, if you read certain headlines, you may be under the impression that Hamas just suddenly decided to fire rockets at Israel, sparking a bloody conflict. So first, we'll talk about just what happened in the past few weeks, and then we'll go over... SOME MORE HISTORY! As you may have already seen through social media, on May 7th and again on May 10th, Israeli police stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest religious site in Islam during Ramadan. Police fired stun grenades and rubber bullets inside the mosque at worshippers, injuring over 300 Palestinians. The police presence was in response to protests against the looming forced evictions of eight Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah, East Jerusalem, by Israeli authorities. East Jerusalem is a Palestinian territory that has been illegally occupied by Israel since 1967. Why are Palestinians facing forced evictions? Well, in a word, ethnic cleansing. I... I'm sorry. That was two words. For more info on the definite ethnic cleansing, see our other happy, fun, upbeat video on Palestine. Or like, I don't know, read what Israeli officials have to say, or look at some f***ing maps. But anyway, as it turns out, the rocket attacks by Hamas did not come out of nowhere, and in fact were pretty predictable, given that Hamas's military leader, Mohammed Daif, made a statement on May 5th. The Qassam Brigades will not stand idly by in the face of attacks on the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. They will pay a heavy price if the aggression against our people in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood does not stop immediately. This was on May 5th, in response to police violence against protesters. The Israeli police's escalation to storming the Al-Aqsa Mosque happened days later, on May 7th and May 10th. So the rocket attacks aren't exactly random violence if Hamas is giving a direct threat and explanation of the violence. But Cody, says patriotic anime titty lover 69, are you siding with Hamas? Do you stand terrorism? Well, thank you patriotic anime titty lover 69 for your service. Obviously, Hamas sucks, but pointing out that Hamas's actions are not random acts of violence isn't the same as siding with them, nor is solidarity with Palestinians, as Ted Cruz and Ben Shapiro and other liars might want you to believe. To be clear, hurting civilians is never justified, even when it's in retaliation, and especially when it's an escalation of violence. When Hamas fires at Israel, injuring or killing random civilians, not only is it a travesty for Israeli civilians who are harmed, it also undermines public sympathy for innocent Palestinians. Hamas's actions give the Israeli military quote-unquote justification to bomb and kill tenfold Gazans and continue to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. I'm sorry, wait, I... What I meant to say is... Hamas's actions gave Israel justification to do surgical airstrikes against Hamas that ends up killing sickening numbers of children, top doctors, destroying their one coronavirus testing site, flattening residencies, and demolishing buildings, housing media organizations, including the Associated Press, and hitting refugee camps. You know, surgical war crimes. Every time the Israeli military kills a child, a doctor, destroys media outlets, or levels a residential block, they use Hamas as a justification in the name of self-defense. Weirdly, this right to defend itself is never extended to Palestine. But whatever, the IDF can bomb anything at once if Hamas even farts within 500 miles of the target. The Israeli government claimed Hamas was hiding in the AP media building and we showed the US evidence, despite the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken saying the US hasn't seen any of this evidence. Yikes guys, awkward. Maybe work on your story together before you go to the press. Apparently, Hamas is hiding behind every child killed in Gaza. To put it in terms that we in the US can understand, Hamas is a bit like cocaine. 
Did police do an unwarranted arrest and a bit of brutality? Oh well, what do you know? Turns out we put, I mean found, cocaine in their wallet. Oops, did we do a few war crimes? Well, we found Hamas in their wallets, we swear. In the IDF's words, they just had to bomb that refugee camp because an apartment nearby was used as terror infrastructure in the area of the Al-Shati refugee camp. Was it really? Who knows now? Because it's all been blown to smithereens. Also, apparently the alleged targets were some computers which were removed before the strike, so whoops. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, indicted with criminal charges of corruption and bribery, argues that Hamas hides behind civilians. The human shields argument is interesting, in that even if it were true, the answer always seems to be, so we murdered the shit out of the human shield. It's like in Die Hard, when Hans Gruber holds Holly Gennaro hostage and goes, to get to me, you'll have to shoot the hostage, or whatever. And then John McClane goes, okay, and shoots both of them. And then the movie ends, victorious. And this part of the episode is honestly the most levity we're going to get with this topic. So like, we have to do an ad and we're going to. So um, here's, here's the transition to that, okay? Okay, sorry. Hey, it's the ad part for advertising. This year, you might be a little more adventurous in going out. You might just keep staying inside. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's neither, somehow. When I do any combination of those, I can wear Mack Weldon to feel stylish and comfortable. And if you haven't guessed, Mack Weldon is sponsoring this video, and they are offering you 20% off your first order when you visit MacWeldon.com slash some news and use code some news. Mack Weldon has a wide variety of men's essentials, socks, shirts, hoodies, underwear, polos, or active shorts. Some might say that those are also women's essentials. You can all get them. It's fine. I don't care. The point is, Mack Weldon promises comfort and a consistent fit. They have a wide range of customizable fabrics to keep you comfy no matter what your day is like. If you don't like the first pair of underwear from them, you can keep them and still get a refund. Their free loyalty program, Weldon Blue, gets you free shipping for life for level one, and once you reach level two by spending $200, you get 20% off every order for the next year. I got their sweatpants, wore them, and didn't take them off for time period redacted. I also got what they refer to as Sunday pants. They look like pants you can wear outside and out and about. They feel like you're never leaving the house again. Can you guess which one I chose? Wide spectrum of extremely comfortable possibilities is my point. So, for 20% off your first order, visit MacWeldon.com slash some news and enter promo code some news. Goodbye to this advertisement. Wow, what a smooth transition to and from an advertisement while talking about war crimes and stuff. Good God. Okay, anyway, back to Hamas and the IDF. It's unfair to compare Hamas to the IDF, says patriotic anime titty lover 69, the horniest straw man I've ever made up for the sake of an argument. Hamas is evil, while the IDF is the most moral army in the world, according to a tweet from Netanyahu sharing a Prager U video. They have vegan boots, for God's sake. Sure, both Hamas and the IDF bomb civilians, but but the IDF does it veganly. It is actually unfair to compare the IDF to Hamas, because the IDF has one of the most well-equipped, heavily US-funded armies in the Middle East, whereas Hamas does not. Israel ranks 14th globally in terms of military funding, with over $21 billion in spending, or almost 6% of its GDP. $3.8 billion came from the US and military aid to Israel in 2020, an annual commitment. And the US sells hundreds of millions of dollars worth of advanced military equipment to Israel every year. Israel has compulsory military service of 30 months for men and 24 months for women, sexist, the draft starting 18 years and older. They had over 170,000 active duty military personnel as of 2018, and they have a secret nuclear arsenal. That's not a joke. They literally have an estimated 80 secret nuclear warheads. Meanwhile, 
Hamas's militant numbers are estimated in the tens of thousands. Their main weapons are unguided rockets as opposed to Israel's precision missiles. Israel and Egypt have deployed a military land, air, and sea blockade around Gaza since 2007. And while the blockade's good at preventing things like clean water, medicine, humanitarian aid from entering the country, it's been unable to prevent rocket materials from being smuggled into Gaza. Rockets can even be made out of plumbing pipes, repurposed dud Israeli bombs, burning sugar and fertilizer. Through a patchwork of domestic production and smuggling, Hamas had an estimated supply of 7,000 rockets before the current conflict. While it's not nothing, it's next to nothing compared to Israel's $21 billion price tag military. And Israel's highly advanced US designed and supported Iron Dome intercepts 90% of Hamas's rockets. What this means is a vast difference in the numbers of casualties. Now, it's always weird to compare the numbers of lives lost because obviously to the families of those killed, total body count isn't comforting. But it needs to be mentioned when one side of a conflict bears the brunt of the most casualties, especially when it comes to civilians. In this most recent skirmish or clash or dust up or whatever you want to call it, attacks by Hamas killed 12 people of the 9 million people in Israel including two children. The IDF killed at least 227 of the two million people in Gaza, including 64 children. Gaza is completely surrounded by superior firepower, which is important to keep in mind when Israel's military and police force, as well as illegal settler colonies in the West Bank, continually instigate acts of violence or land grabs in Palestine. Israel knows they can steal land from Palestine, and even if Hamas retaliates, the IDF can utterly devastate Gaza in a hail of missiles. This military dominance is probably why Israeli authorities and settlers are so bold in trying to force Palestinians out of their family homes they've had for over 70 years. The Israeli government might try to argue that kicking grandmothers out of their childhood home is justified because before the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, those homes had belonged to Jewish residents. But strangely enough, this justification isn't used by Israel to allow Arab families to return to their homes they lost after the 1948 Palestinian exodus, or Nakba, when about half of Palestinian Arabs were expelled. NPR's Daniel Estrin explains the situation of a Palestinian man facing eviction from his family's home. One half of his home was claimed by a settler group years ago. Now he's facing eviction from the other half. And here's the thing. Israeli law allows Jews to reclaim these grounds lost in the 1948 war. It does not allow Palestinians to reclaim property they lost in that war. As the man facing eviction puts it, this is a racist, racist, racist law. Indeed, Israel has a lot of racist laws. Apartheid's generally do. The motivations for the illegal Israeli settlements and evictions of Palestinian families in East Jerusalem are made abundantly clear by the people in favor of illegal settlements. But it's really rightfully ours if you look at the history and at like, the wars, and we didn't even start a lot of the wars. And it, we, we conquered these places rightfully, like it's ours. I don't think there's any answer to it. Really? There's only one way, like, I would carpet bomb them. You would That's, carpet bomb them? It's the, only, it's the only way you could deal with it. We take house after house. Uh, all this area uh, will be a Jewish neighborhood. We are not finished the job. We are, we are going to the next neighborhood, and after that we will go more. Our uh, dream that uh, all East Jerusalem uh, will be like uh, West Jerusalem, Jewish capital of Israel. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one. Uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yami. No, I'm from New York, from Long Island. From New York. What right do you have to live here? The right I have is that the owner of the house wants me to live here, and he wants there to be Jews living in this house, and he wants to... And I, I got chosen for whatever reason, it ended up being me. So why me do you live as, here? Because I live here, because it's important, and because not too many people want to live here, and it's important to, to strengthen this neighborhood, to make sure that this neighborhood is not lost in any future peace deal. So your but position yeah. here is a political position to keep Palestinians out of it? Not to keep Palestinians out of it, to keep Jews in it. Yup, that's a guy from Long Island stealing a Palestinian's house, just shrugging his shoulders and going, well, it's not ethnic cleansing. We're just, you know, kicking everyone out of a certain ethnicity. Now, to be clear, 
This is not fully representative of everyone in Israel. I mean, obviously, this guy's from f***ing Long Island. And while many Israelis support illegal settlements and annexation, this is obviously not true of everyone in Israel. But Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, is an activist organization shining a light on the abuses of the occupation. Breaking the Silence is a group of former IDF soldiers who served in the Israeli military since the start of the Second Intifada and have taken it upon themselves to expose the Israeli public to the reality of everyday life in the occupied territories and the cases of abuse toward Palestinians, looting and destruction of property that they have been witnesses to. It's also important to note that Israel is very much not necessarily representative of Jewish people worldwide. American Jews, particularly those who are young and more secular, often question Israel's colonization of Palestinian territory. In 2019, 25% of American Jews were in favor of completely dismantling all the illegal Israeli settlements. Oh, and by the way, I keep calling them illegal settlements because the international community has agreed that they're f***ing illegal. In contrast, only 6% of Israelis were in favor of such a move. A majority of American Jews think Netanyahu is not doing a good job, and only one in three think Israel is making a sincere effort towards achieving peace with Palestinians. There are Jewish groups in America dedicated to fighting for the rights of Palestine, like the activist group Jewish Voice for Peace. We are here gathering to remind ourselves, remind our community, and let the world know that uprooting people and displacing communities is not a Jewish value, it's not a human value. These kinds of acts is immoral and unethical. The reason that there are plenty of Jewish groups who support Palestinian human rights is that you can't equate Judaism to Israel's policies. It's not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel or Israeli policies because Jews in general and a specific country's government are not the same. Much like if you show support for Palestinians, you're not in bed with Hamas terrorists or whatever lying little worm Ted Cruz might say. On the other hand, it is actually anti-Semitic to say that all Jews should or do support Israel's actions. Alan Dershowitz calling Bernie Sanders a self-hating Jew for criticizing Israel is just as anti-Semitic as holding all Jewish people responsible for the Israeli government's actions. It's being reported by the ADL that there has been a rise in anti-Semitism following the recent violence in Gaza. On their list of examples, there are some horrific things. They also listed as examples of anti-Semitism, people holding protest signs critical of Zionism. These are not the same. And it's also interesting that pro-Palestine protests are all described as anti-Israel protests, but to be clear, support for Palestine or criticism of Israel doesn't equate to anti-Semitism and shouldn't be used as motivation for it. And actually, nothing should be used as motivation for anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is dumb as f also, the claim that it is anti-Semitic to criticize Israel or support Palestine is not true and shouldn't be used as an excuse to ignore the key issue. Now, this is not to say that religion never plays a role in support for Israeli colonial policy. Support for Israel is weirdly high among evangelicals who, you know, think it's important for the end times prophecy where everyone but them, including Jews, will be sent to hell. Very cool and very normal religious fundamentalists to have 35% of here in the US. In fact, Israel's colonization is so popular among U.S. evangelicals as compared to U.S. Jews, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Ron Dermer said, People have to understand the backbone of Israel's support in the United States is the evangelical Christians. That's the backbone. And it's true because of numbers uh, and also because of their passionate and unequivocal support for Israel. Look at numbers. I mean, sure, evangelicals are only supporting Israel because they think it's prophesied to set in motion the end time during which unrepentant Jews will go to hell, but hey, gotta make friends where you can find them. Speaking of religion, another argument for the relentless abuse and killing of people in Gaza is that Hamas are religious fundamentalists and anti-gay. You know, like what we have in America, but bad because they're not Christian. Also, while Israel does recognize gay marriages performed in other countries, you can't actually get gay married while there. But anyway, yes, of course, of course, sure, religious fundamentalists suck and have a bad track record on human rights. I'm not sure that means you should do collective punishment, a war crime, or skirmish crime if you prefer, by stealing people's homes and bombing people. Because if that's the case, we're a... Uh,
We're in a bit of trouble here in America. But yeah, it's too bad that Gaza is dominated by Hamas and doesn't have a less theocratic government like they had back before the 1970s, when the Israeli government helped fund the rise of Hamas. Uh-oh! Kind of like the oopsie the CIA did when they helped create Osama bin Laden by funding Mujahideen groups to fight against the Soviets during the Cold War. Sad trombone noise. No, like, do the sound. <sighs> Never mind. As reported by The Intercept, for... Former Israeli military official General Yitzhak Segev admitted as such. Segev was the acting governor of Gaza in the 1980s during Israel's takeover and told a New York Times reporter that he had provided funds to Islamists as a counterweight to secular leftists of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Fatah Party. In addition to funding religious fundamentalists in Gaza, the Israeli military also selectively targeted the secular PLO and Fatah Party while allowing Hamas to grow. According to a Wall Street Journal article published in 2009, in Gaza, Israel hunted down members of Fatah and other secular PLO factions, but it dropped harsh restrictions imposed on Islamic activists by the territory's previous Egyptian rulers. Israeli historian Avner Cohen said, Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation, and was an enormous stupid mistake, or as we like to say on this show, an oopsie goofer of colossal proportions. Now, while some historians view Israel's early fostering of religious extremists in Gaza as a bit of a mistake, bombing the sh** out of Gaza in the name of getting Hamas sure is benefiting one guy. That's right, Prime Minister of Israel and indicted of bribery and corruption man himself, Benjamin Netanyahu. You see, Netanyahu was on the cusp of losing power as his political opponents were nearing the completion of a coalition agreement between the Palestinian-Israeli minority in parliament and right-wing defectors who no longer supported Netanyahu. But, as opposition leader Yair Lapid stated, the fire always breaks out just when it's most convenient for the prime minister. The attacks on the mosque and subsequent retaliation by Hamas leading to the bombing of Gaza caused the opposition coalition to fall apart due to tensions among its members. While Netanyahu himself didn't send out a memo saying, please escalate tensions in Gaza, according to the LA Times, around the time that the coalition forming mandate was passed to Lapid, simmering tensions in Jerusalem boiled over, exacerbated by what turned out to be fateful moves by allies of the prime minister. Those included Israel Israeli authorities blocking a central gathering point for Palestinians just outside the Old City during the opening days of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, police raids on the Aqsa Mosque compound on a plateau sacred to both Jews and Muslims, and the prospective eviction of several Palestinian families in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. A leader of a country and his allies wanting to use war and bloodshed for political gain? Shocking! Unheard of! I will not look to my right, your left. Well, at least there's a ceasefire. Even though the first ceasefire Hamas proposed was rejected by Israel, and the US blocked the UN resolution calling for a ceasefire because it was mildly critical of all the murders the Israeli military was doing, but after bombing a few more doctors in the Associated Press building, Israel finally agreed to the ceasefire. And immediately after that, Israeli police and settlers stormed the Al-Aqsa area, arresting Palestinian worshippers. And in Sheikh Jarrah, Israeli authorities are still bent on evicting Palestinian residents. Oh, and Israelis are doing mass arrests of Palestinian citizens of Israel for protesting the bombings of Gaza with sit-ins. You know, the oppressive ethnic cleansing stuff we talked about in the beginning of the episode. Except now it's the end of the episode because time is a nightmare and nothing is ever learned. But maybe some things are learned because support for Palestinians is growing in the US, with a definite shift in the discourse, including progressive lawmakers being increasingly straightforward about apartheid in Israel-Palestine. And there have been pro-Palestinian protests cropping up in major cities all over the US and the world. In fact, maybe it's because people finally recognize the extreme badness of all the war crimes against Gazans that Israel finally agreed to a ceasefire. This Conflict, skirmish, war, crime, arama only lasted for 11 days. Whereas the 2014 Gaza war lasted for seven weeks and killed over 2,000 Gazans, 67 Israeli soldiers, and five Israeli citizens. War crimes are still bad, but fewer war crimes is definitely better. 
They're still silencing journalists who recognize that Palestinians deserve human rights, such as the firing of former AP journalist Emily Wilder after being cancel cultured by conservatives. But people seem to actually be pissed off by it, and other AP journalists are rallying behind Wilder. It's weird. It's like, it's like AP journalists maybe think it's not good to silence a pro-Palestinian rights reporter after their offices were obliterated by Israel in the name of killing Palestinians. So, things are still bad. But people are starting to see how bad things are. And seeing that something is bad is the first step in making it less bad. And possibly at some point in the future, may be good. And that is $20 for old Cody. You see, Katie bet me that I couldn't end this episode on a positive note, but ha ha ha, I did. And now old Cody's gonna buy himself 20 of some joke thing that costs a dollar or probably just donate it to one of the charities in the description. Honestly, please just roll the credits. Do the trombone again. Do the trombone again! Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching, and I'm sorry I threw that at you. Um, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment or not. And we've got a patreon.com slash some more news. We've got a podcast called Even More News. We've got merch if you like it. We've got other videos. We've got pizzazz. All right, bye.